It doesn't matter if you're highly processed or not, as long as it's low in fat, it's good for you. That's not true. If you eat natural foods, it doesn't matter that much what your macronutrient composition is. If you actually look at the success rate of counting calories, it's about one to 5%. Describe the food environment for us that you see as being uh, dry, you know, behind the driver's seat of the epidemic of obesity and kidney disease uh, that you're seeing. Is it I the think, environment? I think it is the environment. Um, you know, there's a lot of these sort of um, people out there that try and say, oh, it's about willpower, willpower, willpower. And I don't think it's true. I don't think the obesity epidemic is an obesity of low willpower. I just don't think that's true. I think that it's the food environment that we find ourselves in, the teaching we find ourselves in, because the the you know the, the the part of the issue is the the way that we've sort of gotten to this stage is one that's been very uh, strange. So, you know, in the '60s and '70s, there wasn't a lot of obesity. People didn't really watch what they ate. I mean, they're eating cookies, they're eating ice cream. You know, I ate a sandwich every day with a juice box and a cookie. Right, I brown bagged that like literally every day for all of high school, all of middle school. So like for like 10, 11 years straight, that's what I ate. Right. So that's two slices of white bread, processed meat, juice, and a cookie. It's like, that's almost as bad <laughs> as you can get. Uh, it's terrible, but I ate that every day. And so did most of my, um, friends. So it, it it's it's not that the foods are um, were great back then either. I mean, but the environment that we find ourselves in is much different. And it started with the sort of low fat dogma of the 1970s. And of course, one of the things that people uh, forget is that when you move to a low fat environment, what they did was they encouraged um, food companies to bring out a lot of processed foods that were lower in fat so that we could eat the foods that we normally ate, but lower in fat. So you had, um, you know, snack wells and all that sort of stuff, which was supposed to be good for you because it was low in fat. The problem is it was a highly processed, a lot of carbohydrates, but, you know, they added lots of sugar and stuff to make up for the flavor. And that wasn't a good trade-off. So about 10 years later, you started to see a lot of type 2 diabetes. The obesity epidemic started almost immediately right after. But the other thing that happened is that as you started to eat a lot of processed foods, um, you get this sort of spike in uh, insulin. So if you eat like two slices of white bread and jam in the morning, for example, your glucose spikes up, your insulin spikes up, then it spikes down. So by 1030, you're just ravenously hungry because you're, 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 you know, all that food has gone into storage because insulin is high all those calories have gone into storage, your body's like, hey, I have nothing left here. So let's go eat. So you go get yourself a low fat muffin. And then of course, as sugar spikes up, sugar spikes down by lunch, you're hungry, you go get yourself a big plate of low fat pasta, sugar spikes up, sugar spikes down by three o'clock, you're hungry again. So you go get some low fat muffins or, you know, a bagel or something like that, right? Again, same thing, sugar spikes up, sugar spikes down. So this was this this point in time where people were eating all the time because they were eating highly processed foods with no sort of satiety. Like if you ate bacon and eggs in the morning, you weren't that hungry at 1030. If you, eat, you know, white bread and jam, you were. And that's um, where people started to think, hey, I'm eating six times a day where I used to eat three times a day. Uh, I need to go get granola bars all the time because, you know, full of sugar and stuff because I'm hungry at three o'clock. And so then people start, but I'm eating low fat. So therefore it must be good. Therefore eating six times a day must be good, but it never was good. It was just that you're eating highly processed foods that, you know, that, that weren't natural foods. And that was what was causing it. So that, that's sort of how that whole thing came about where we started to believe that eating snacking was good for you, as opposed to the previous sort of hundred years where snacking was actively discouraged. Like you shouldn't be eating in front of your computer. You shouldn't be eating while reading. You shouldn't be eating in front of the TV. You should eat at a table with other people with a properly cooked meal, right? Now it's like, grab whatever you can, 
from wherever you can, and, and it's all crappy food. So that's how we, we believed it. Then we started teaching our children, right? So you look at our, you know, my kids' schedules, you know, they'd have breakfast in the morning and then they'd get like a mid-morning snack, then they'd have lunch, then they'd have an after-school snack, then they'd have dinner, then while playing soccer, in between the halves of soccer, parents were like, they need to have a snack. I'm like, God, that's like six times a day. I remember one time my the, the school sends home this piece of paper says, oh, the kids are going away on some field trip or something. You're going to be on the bus, you know, coming back at like four o'clock or whatever. They're going for at one after lunch and they're coming back. Please pack them two snacks. I'm like, why did you not feed them lunch? Are they not <laughs> eating dinner? Like, but, but it gets normalized, right? That's the point. I'm not blaming the schools. They're just sort of responding. But it gets normalized that you must eat all the time, even to lose weight. And it's like, that's not true. What you need to do is get back to those natural foods that you're eating, not the processed food, because the whole processed food boom was sort of kicked off by this dietary guidelines, which focused us on macronutrients as opposed to foods, right? And that was a deadly, deadly mistake. So when you start saying things like you should eat low fat, that means fat is the thing that's bad for you. It doesn't matter if you're highly processed or not, as long as it's low in fat, it's good for you. That's not true. You, you know, if you eat natural foods, it doesn't matter that much what your macronutrient composition is. Your body knows how to handle it. That's how you had people eating sort of very high, uh, you know, meat diets versus very high vegetarian diets, and still relatively low um, obesity. It wasn't the nutrients; is mm. the processing. Our body has been eating meat for you know millions of years. We've been eating plants for millions of years. Our body knows how to keep that in check. Because the amount of body fat you carry is very important to you. In the wild, if you have too much body fat, you're going to get eaten and you can't catch food. So you're going to die. So if you have too much fat, you're, you're going to die. Mm -hmm. But if you eat natural foods, our bodies will automatically adjust, right? So you, you, if you eat natural foods, even if they are high in carbs or whatever, your body will say, okay, that's enough. You should stop eating. And then your body will adjust. So um, that's this whole processed food thing. So it was tied in. So the two big things I think in terms of the diet is eating just highly processed foods as opposed to natural foods. That's probably the most important more than any macronutrient like fat or carbs or protein. And, um, that's what you need to focus on, which gets lost in the whole discussion of high carb versus low carb and stuff like that. And then the, the linked part of that is don't eat all the time. Like you just, it's just not part of a healthy lifestyle. You have to eat when you eat and not eat when you, you know, uh, so you can digest that food that you've eaten. Uh, you know, the, the concept is fairly simple. If you're eating, your body's going to store calories. If you're not eating, your body's going to use those calories that you took in. So you need to keep them in balance. If you don't, if you are eating all the time, you're telling your body store fat all the time. So of course you're going to gain weight. Like there's no other way around it. So give your body the time it needs to use those calories that you took in during your meal times. Right. And that's what was missing. People said, Oh, you know, you get up, you have to eat breakfast, right? Eat, 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 eat. And then don't forget your bedtime snack. It's like, okay, but when was your body going to use up those calories <laughs> that you're eating all the time, right? It, it was, it, you know, the whole, the whole discussion I found, frankly, just, you know, it, it was, it was sort of ridiculous at the point at which we got ourselves to. Yeah. We really need to undo decades of bad advice. And when you were talking about you know, the, the drive to consume breakfast and snack all day, it made me realize how complicit the food industry and governmental regulatory agencies are in the obesity epidemic. Because if you look around, if you wander through the aisles of the modern supermarket, you're going to see health claims on cereals, on granola bars, on instant oatmeals, on all of the packaged crap that have tons of added sugar to them. But you're never going to see health claims on a dozen eggs or yeah. on an avocado or on uh, a piece of uh, you know steak for that matter. Um, yeah. So your average consumer walks through the supermarkets w intending on eating a healthful diet. They see all the red heart healthy logos on the cereals, on the granola bars. 
it's no wonder that's what Americans are, are, are mostly consuming. Yeah. And, and, and it's, it's crazy because it's like things like red meat, for example, it's like, you know, we talk about this, Oh, red meat, red meat. Like do you, because red meat is new to our diet. Is that why? Like we haven't been eating red meat for the last, you know, million years. Like our body sort of knows what to do when you eat meat. Like it knows how to handle it without getting sick. Um, you know, because you can't eat that much meat. Like it, it makes you full. There's, it's, it's very satiating. Like it's very hard to overeat meat. It's, it's, uh, you have to process it to get that real, you know, overeating sort of uh, syndrome. So same with eggs, right? It's like we demonized eggs for so long, right? Whole, whole fat dairy, we demonized butter, we demonized, right? And it's decades, right? From the seventies. And this was also a very sad story, right? So we said, oh, butter is high in saturated fat. It's going to cause heart attacks. It's like, but don't, don't you realize that we've been eating butter for <laughs> several millennia <laughs> without causing heart disease? And now in 1970, it causes heart disease. But anyway, so we, we, we demonized butter, which was high in saturated fat, but it was a natural fat. So it wasn't that bad for you. Then we told people to eat margarine, right? And that's where Bissell and all these other things came out. Turns out, of course, to make it um, spreadable and stuff, they use a lot of trans fats were actually, they were killing you, right? They, they caused tons of heart disease. So I think uh, there's one study that estimated that switch from butter to margarine caused about 100,000 heart attacks per year in the oh United God. States. So think about this for a second. This misguided race to go low fat so that we would have less heart attacks actually caused more heart attacks right? A lot more heart attacks because we switched from the natural fat, which was butter to margarine with trans fats, which actually were causing a lot of heart disease. Like we know that now that wasn't so evident in the seventies and eighties, but it's, it's one of these things where it's this hubris that we think we can do better than nature, right? We're smarter than nature. Like we can make a better breast milk than breast milk, right? It's like, come on, that's ridiculous. Our bodies have evolved for breast milk. And now, of course, and this was, again, in the 70s, 80s, people were being fed formula, even though mothers were perfectly fine, had perfectly you know, adequate sources of breast milk. They were fed formula because there was this whole idea that it was better. Uh, of course, it took decades <laughs> of that before finally people said, hey, you know, breast milk is actually quite good for you. There's all kinds of good stuff in here. So then we've, we've gone back to breast is best and so on. But it's the same idea, right? We have the same thing with foods. We can make more foods healthier by processing the hell out of them so that we can fit some pre-specified notion of low carb, high carb, low fat, low fat, you know, high fat, you know, whatever. Yeah. And we can make a better food than what is naturally there. And it's like, we can't. Don't think that you can because this is just the way we've we've grown up and 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 it's not that there's something intrinsically wrong it's just you know i say you know it's like um you know i use something called the parable of the cow so two cows one day are you know talking and they're saying hey did you see the latest nutrition evidence says that we should be eating meat of course the diet was done on lions but they so the cows start eating meat then they die and then the lions come in and say hey you see the latest studies that say grass is the best. Of course, the study was done on cows, right? And then they start eating grass and done. But the point is that you have to eat the foods that you evolved with. It's not that anything's intrinsically good or bad. It's what the foods that we eat. So if, we're, if we haven't evolved to eat margarine, that margarine is probably going to do us a lot of harm, which it did. If you are evolved to eat butter, then the butter probably is not going to do you much harm. And it, it wasn't. So it took us literally from the 70s to the 2010s, the mid 2010s, before butter was sort of acceptable. Right? It was <laughs> through the 2000s, avocados were like, whoa, why the heck are you eating avocados? Why are you eating olive oil? Right? That took decades for us mm -hmm. to get back right? If we had just said, look, if it's, if it's natural, if it's unprocessed, if it's a traditional food, it's probably okay. 
if it's not, and that includes beef, that includes, you know, meat and stuff, right? Uh, uh, but if it's not, then it's probably not okay. And that's sort of the most important factor. Um, but again, it gets lost because the food industry doesn't make that much money. Uh, like if you sell broccoli, you sell broccoli. You can't, you know, put it in a box and try and sell it, upsell it for twice the price. Yeah. I mean, stocks of broccoli don't have a big glaring red heart on them. Yeah in the supermarket begging you to eat them. But you walk through the aisles, which is where we know all the ultra processed foods lie in wait. There's health claim after health claim. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. I mean, the whole thing is crazy. And that's where I started um, when I was writing the obesity code um, sort of got to where it's like, look, we got to like start to educate people on the basics of nutrition and you know, fasting is part of that because it had gone so far um, as we were talking about, oh, you know, there's, there's all these things like tracking your macros, right? It's huge. So you have to have this percentage fat and this, and it's like, but that's not the way we eat. We eat foods. It's like, you don't, you don't know what percentage carbs a, a cauliflower is unless you look it up. So what you need to do is really focus on the foods. Um, but even then, that's that's sort of the minority. Uh, what what you get taught in medical school is uh, number of calories, you know, percentage fat, percentage carbs. You know, it's like uh, that's the wrong thing. Like, is it natural? That's all you need to know. Are you eating constantly? If you are, then you'll probably gain weight. If you're not, then you probably won't be gaining weight. What are the qualities of these ultra processed foods that make them so prone to driving hunger, obesity, chronic disease? I think it's because uh, it sort of uh, bypasses a lot of our natural uh, satiety signals. And um, so when you eat natural foods, there, there, there are hormones that go up. So you eat steak, for example, and certain hormones will go up. So cholecystokinin in response to dietary fat and PYY in response to protein. So when you reach a certain point, your body says enough that you're full, like don't eat anymore. And it's not easy to overcome that. And that's why you have those restaurants that will say, oh, eat this 60 ounce steak and we'll give it to you free. They're not giving out a lot of free steaks because it's just really hard to keep eating when you're full. Um, that's the same thing you see in the all you can eat restaurants. So everybody's gone to one of those, you're completely full. And you know, if somebody slaps down two pieces of like pork chop, you'll be like, Bleh. you know, <laughs> I'm going to throw up. Right. It's, but, but those are the same pork chops that you ate at the beginning of the meal. Perfectly fine. So it's not to do with the pork chop. It's the fact that your hormones are just basically screaming at you to stop. And we have that for all natural foods because we've evolved to eat. So if you eat vegetables, for example, it's, it's got bulk. And so it fills up your stomach and then that sends out signals, stretch receptors in the stomach will send out the signals, stop, don't eat. So for example, if you have people with bezoars, which is hair, like, so some people, you know, or cats or something the, they'll, uh, you know, ingest hair, uh, accidentally and their stomachs will fill up. They actually can't eat because their stomach is just full of hair. So, and, and, and the stretch receptors will tell your body, Hey, stop eating, stop eating. So if you're eating something, which is very bulky, like salads or something like that, you can't eat, you can't just keep eating them. Once you start processing foods, you can get rid of those things that make you stop eating. And it's very highly profitable to do so, of course, because you want people, if you're trying to sell product, you want people to eat. So what you do when you make a cookie, for example, is you take white flour. So what you do is you take out all the fat in it, right? So flour is almost pure carbohydrate. You've taken out all the fat, you've taken out all the proteins. So you have nothing that actually makes you full. <laughs> you can keep eating that almost indefinitely. You also take out all the fiber. So all that bulk that you get with the uh, wheat or whatever, like you don't have that anymore. So there's no bulk, there's no fat, there's no protein. Well, there's no satiety signaling at all. So if you think about that all you can eat buffet, you can't eat those two pork chops, but you could eat a cookie for dessert, right? Because there's, there's no satiety signaling there. You could drink some Coke, which is pure sugar. There's a lot of calories there. But there's nothing that is going to scream at you to stop taking it. So you don't. 
And that's why ultra processed foods and their studies on this uh, always lead to overeating because there's no natural breaks on that system. And even if you're not hungry, even if you're completely full, you can still take them down. So if you are full and you're not hungry and somebody uh, says, oh, but you must eat to lose weight. So go have something. You're not going to get yourself a pork chop one, because it's hard to, because you have to go fry it up. But two, you don't want that. Your body is going to say, oh, I'm nauseated. It's like, I, you know, if you have lunch and then somebody says, oh, you have to eat a snack at 2.30, you're not going to get yourself a, you know, a porterhouse steak. So you're going to go get some highly processed food, like a low fat muffin or a cookie or a granola bar. And that's what's going to happen. So the, the two things is that one, it leads to overeating in terms of the quantity and two, it leads to overeating in terms of the frequency in which you do it. So, uh, you know, both of those are bad. Like when you're full, you know, your body is telling you, you don't need to eat. I'm, I'm using up the stuff that's coming in. Don't take, put any more in, right? Just, just use it up. But now if you need to force something down because of our sort of misguided teachings for the last sort of 30 years, then you're not going to be able to take down something natural. You're going to have to take down something highly processed. But that was the problem in the first place. So you get down that low fat muffin, but it ain't doing you any favors because, you know, your body's just going to, it's got more, more, you know, more uh, to deal with. Yeah. It's so interesting. Um, I see you sometimes butt heads with people in the fitness community uh, who love to promote the idea that, or, or at least imply that calories are all that matter when it comes to weight loss um, yeah. or, weight, or weight gain for that matter. Um, could you, uh, could you give us a sense of that, of that sort of conflict? I believe it's really kind of, um, you know, there are some that just promote this idea that so long as you're tracking your calories, you can eat whatever you want. Um, and then there are others yeah. that, that, that I guess promote the idea that that's actually, uh, you know, a reductionist approach that doesn't really take into account the full breadth of how foods affect hormones and as a result drive, um, feelings of hunger, satiety and the like, um, give us the lay of the land of that sort of conflict, which seems to be, uh, you know, all, always going on, um, yeah, in, in, in social media calories, nutrition discourse. Yeah. It's always the fitness people. And, um, I generally don't engage with them, but they like to, they like to attack me anyway. Um, because what I'm trying to do is try and give people more nuanced approach. And you see this with doctors too. They say, Oh, calories is all that matters. It's like, okay, but that's a very simplistic approach because what's important is the calories, there's calories, but what's more important is what's controlling how many calories we take, right? So calories is sort of a proximate uh, cause, whereas you need to look at the ultimate cause. If you're always hungry and that's where you're taking more calories, well, that is a problem, right? Yes, it's still the calories that are the problem, um, but not, all, and, and it also gives you this idea that all calories are the same. All calories are gonna produce the same satiety, for example. They don't. They're nothing alike. You could drink a thousand calories of some sugary drink and get zero satiety out of that. So how is it calories, calories, calories? Yes, if you decide to you know, count your calories down to the last one, you think that you can lose weight, but almost nobody does. Because what happens, of course, is that if you eat the wrong foods, and you go from 2,000 calories to 1,500 calories, people say, oh, you're going to lose weight. You almost never do because they always say caloric deficit, caloric deficit, but they're not understanding that if, you're bought, if you eat 1,500 calories instead of 2,000, but your body goes from burning 2,000 to burning 1,500, you still haven't lost weight. And that's exactly what happens. We've shown this in study after study. Almost every study for the last 50 years shows the same thing. When you restrict calories without looking at the foods, without looking at satiety, without looking at all these ultra processed foods, without looking at frequency of food, when you just restrict calories alone, what happens is that your body responds by burning fewer calories, in which case your caloric deficit disappears. 
So technically it's true. It's about a caloric deficit, right? And they always say, well, you're just denying science. It's like, no, you're just not understanding that what's important is not the calories themselves, but sort of what goes, what's going on behind the scenes, the foods behind, like you want to pretend that hundred calories of broccoli is equal to hundred calories of soda. In that they both have hundred calories, that's true. But look at it this way. Our response to the broccoli and the soda are completely different. Satiety effect, completely different. Effect on metab- metabolic rate, completely different. So why would you say they're the same? Nobody gets fat eating broccoli, almost ever. So why would you say that that's true? So you got to get back to the foods. The reason the fitness people are so gung-ho, one, is that they are generally very fit themselves. Mm -hmm. So they want to use it as proof that they're better than you. And that's basically it. Their whole self-worth is based on the fact that they're fit. And therefore, they want that as proof that they have more knowledge and more willpower than you. And therefore, they can sell it. And that's basically all. It makes them feel good about themselves. When they say, oh, it's all about calories, 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 what they're saying is that, look at me, I'm fit, so you must look up to me. That's it. It's a, it's a big ego trip for them, right? They don't understand the science behind it. Like The body has no calorie receptors. So when you take 100 calories of cookies versus 100 calories of broccoli, the body doesn't know how many calories you're taking. The body only knows what happens once you eat, and that's the hormonal response whether it's peptide YY, cholecystokinin, insulin, cortisol, that complex interplay of the hormones that are released in response to the 100 calories of cookies is different than the hormones released in response to the 100 calories of salmon or eggs or whatever you want. They're completely different. And all it means is that those two foods have different fattening effects. Cookies are more fattening than broccoli. Well, Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Your grandmother could have told you that cookies are more fattening than than broccoli. Like, come on. That's the only thing it means. It doesn't mean I'm denying that foods have calories and calories are not important and stuff. I'm saying some foods are more fattening than others. And they don't get that because they're so invested. Like one, they've spent several decades in the field and they're like, they're, they're, they've grown up on this whole calories, calories, calories thing. And the truth is that it hasn't worked. I mean, if counting calories was successful, you, I would be the first guy out here telling people to count their calories, okay? But if you actually look at the success rate of counting calories, it's about 1% to 5%. That's the data. So Somewhere between 95 and 90%, 99% of people fail to lose weight counting calories. So why would I recommend that as a strategy? How is that useful to my patient? If I recommend something that has a 99% chance of failure for you, you'd say, I want another doctor, please. And that's why doctors have sort of largely abandoned the field because what we've been taught, which is mostly espoused by this whole calorie thing, and the fitness people are just the loudest because they have something to sell, which is themselves mostly. Um, and they 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 don't and they've grown up on this whole calories thing, and they don't really want to relearn it. And of course, then of course it would mean that the, their thinness and fitness is not proof of their you know, that they're better than you sort of thing. And, and that's what's tiring to me. It's like, they're not really focused on helping people. Like if they're focused on helping people, why recommend a strategy that we've been doing for the last 35 years, 40 years, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's clearly, clearly failed as a, as a useful strategy for people. So why double down on it? It's like the answer is because that's what they're selling. That's what they're selling. They're selling themselves and, and, and their fitness, their thinness is proof of their, 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 that, you know, their mastery of it, but it's not, I mean, it's just, it's, it's just that the, the, the whole debate is, there's not really even a debate. I, I don't even engage them because it's very hard to make any of them see the actual point of uh, a lot of this stuff. They don't understand, Hey, 
you know, what you say it's all calories. So you're saying that cookies are not more fat or are, are as fattening as broccoli. Or if you say, oh, you need to restrict or everything in moderation. So we should eat cookies in moderation the same way that we eat broccoli in moderation. I should moderate my broccoli intake. Is that what you're telling me? <laughs> I don't think I need to moderate my broccoli intake. I don't think I need to moderate my spinach intake. And if you think I do, like you're, you know, who, who, who believes that, right? <laughs> it's like, that doesn't even make sense. So yes, I mean, there are certain things to focus on because when you start restricting everything, like, yes, you must moderate your intake of every single food on earth. It's like, well, that's a hard diet to follow. I'd rather just say I can eat natural foods. I can eat, you know, meat. I can eat eggs. I can eat everything there that is natural. What I want to moderate is the ultra processed foods, things that are, you know, uh, not natural, like cookies. They're not particularly natural. You don't have cookie trees. <laughs> you don't have cookie trees. I've never seen, <laughs> never seen a cookie tree. I, I, I'm just going to all, uh, offer an alternate viewpoint, um, giving them the benefit of the doubt. You know, I think that there's a, a significant, there's probably a significant selection bias within the fitness community. People who are obsessed with their fitness. So there's a high degree of, of motivation, of passion, of maybe even obsession for people in the fitness community. And these are people for, and, and as a result, these are people for whom tracking meticulously their macro and calorie intake isn't really that difficult. But the problem is that that, while that can work for pretty much anybody who follows it, it ceases to work the minute you stop counting. And your average person isn't going to be as obsessed or have built in the same feedback loops um, over decades of being involved in fitness, being immersed in fitness as some of these fitness influencers. Some of the more some of the loudest fitness influencers have been doing fitness their whole lives. Some of them have even competed in, in, in fitness competitions. So that to me implies a level of, of, of obsession and they make the mistake of, uh, of, of, you know, falsely believing that the masses, the, the, the mainstream dieting population is going to be able to be as, um, invested in, in the tracking of calories as they are. And that's why well, I think the other they, problem, it fails I think so the consistently. Problem is that, yeah. I think tracking calories is not difficult these days. There's tons of apps to do it. The problem is, is it's calories in versus calories out. And it's true, but calories out is mostly, for most people who aren't exercising a lot, is mostly basal metabolic rate. And there's simply no way to track that on a regular basis. Like you can do expensive tests to measure your basal metabolic rate. And that's how many calories you're burning. So if you take exercise out of the equation, uh, just for simplicity's sake, you can reduce the calories that you take in from 2000 to 1500. I have like, I have like hundreds of, of women mostly who have tracked it to a T like mm. they weigh every morsel of food. Then they put it into their app and they write down exactly how many calories they are taking, but they don't lose weight. Why? Because they go down to 1200 calories that they take in on a daily basis. What they don't understand is that, the amount they're burning also went down to 1,200. And they say, I don't understand. This fitness guru said, I just need to, to cut my calories. But you didn't, you, took, you, you didn't take into account half of the equation, which is that whole calories out part. It's not mostly exercise. And yes, if you do six hours a day, then probably you're going to be able to significantly impact that. We saw that on all those biggest loser um, studies, right? I don't know if you've read them, but they track the biggest loser contestants. They all lost a lot of weight, but the problem is their metabolic rates plummeted. So therefore, and they're tracking calories for the most part. So therefore, and, and they made up for it initially with sort of like 10 hours a day of exercise. But as soon as that dropped off, their basal metabolic rates and their basal metabolic rates never went up with exercise. It was continuing to go down because mm -hmm. you can exercise your muscles, but you can't make your liver burn more calories. You can't make your kidney burn more calories. You can't tell your body, Hey, I want my body temperature to go up three degrees. That's all controlled by hormones, which is linked back to the foods that we eat. So you eat low calories of the wrong foods. 
then what happens? You can track that. You can eat a thousand calories. And I've seen people whose basal metabolic rates are like 800 calories a day. So they eat a thousand calories a day. They're gaining weight. Wow. And the people, the fitness people are, oh, that's impossible. It's like, that's because you don't actually deal with patients. Like you just, you just want people to work out, which is great. Like you can work out. That's fine. But the whole point is that unless you have both sides, the calories in and the basal metabolic rate, you don't know what's happening. Like you try and create a caloric deficit, but you only see the input. You don't see the output. So how are you going to create a caloric deficit? You say you need a calorie deficit. You need a, okay. But how are you going to create it? Because counting calories does not, like, I don't have to prove that it doesn't work. Like, who doesn't know that counting calories doesn't work? Like, every single person I meet has done calorie counting. And almost everybody fails. So why do I need to prove that calorie counting doesn't work? I'd love it if it worked. If all I had to do was download an app and take a picture of my food and weigh it and stuff, and I'd for sure lose weight, I'd be the first one to do it. Why? Because it'll make them healthier if they lose weight. I, that's, that's, that's known. But the point is that it doesn't work. And if it doesn't work, then why you, you keep promoting it? So no matter what, all these fitness people are out there. It's all about calories, all about calories. Okay, so you took this sort of 40-year-old position that has clearly failed as the entire world starts to become more obese. And you're defending it against people who want to look at, you know, cal calories in a sort of more broader context of hormones and satiety and energy expenditure and, you know, basal metabolic rate. And you're saying that, you know, that's, that's false. Just make it simple and make it calories. It's like, but the world is not that simple. So, you know, that's, that's, I think why a lot of these, um, these fitness fanatics are out there because again, they pretend it's all in your control. Like it's all, it's just the foods. It's just willpower. It's like, no, it's not just willpower. There's a whole lot more that goes into it. And, um, that's where a lot of the, and, 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 you know, these fitness people who say it's calories, 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 they're in part responsible for a lot of the fat shaming that goes on because by equating calories and f with fatness, with willpower, what you're saying is not that they're fat. You're saying that these people don't deserve respect because they have no willpower. And I don't believe that. I believe that they're doing something wrong. It's the knowledge that they got over, you know, that we taught them. It's the knowledge that needs to be changed. It's the systems that need to be changed, like getting rid of easy to access foods, getting rid of ultra processed foods. It's that, it's the knowledge, not that there's something intrinsically wrong with them. When you say it's all about calories and therefore it's all about willpower and therefore your thinness is a reflection of you as a person, that's where the fat shaming comes in because you don't respect these people because they're fat, because you think that that indicates a character deficit. So while they're out there blustering and blustering, I think it's actually extremely dangerous for them to be talking about this, you know, about that point of view that it's all calories, it's all calories, it's all willpower. You just got to do it. You know, it's like, um, yeah, you're not just wrong, but you're also fostering this entire sort of it's okay to shame fat people because they did it to themselves sort of idea, which I find very distasteful. I mean, I think it's, it's more that the knowledge has to come like, you know, other tools like intermittent fasting and so on need to be uh, tried and so on, as opposed to, to that. So, uh, you know, that's why I have a problem with the calories sort of people. It's one is like, it's, it just doesn't work. And two, it's actually super unhealthy for us to be to be talking about it in that way. It, it, it generates disrespect for people who don't deserve it. Yeah, I'm largely in agreement with you. I think it's uh, I think it does a massive disservice um, to people that get caught in that net where maybe they they they'll see somebody on, for example, the Explore page on Instagram go over, and then they get sucked into this vortex, this universe where all that matters are calories in, calories out, calorie deficit, yada, yada. I think it's, um, it's, it's harmful unless you, unless you're putting ahead of that, the, 
the, the, the facts about how food affects behavior, how the quality of the food and what you choose to eat ultimately dictates how much you eat. Because otherwise, you're just going to be spinning your wheels caught in this endless vortex of of hunger. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it, it's that acknowledgement that they often don't have. Uh, that is, it's all about calories. It's like, so, you know, but if I were to eat, you know, just a lot of broccoli and not track my calories, would that work? It's like, sure, of course it would work, right? But the 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 whole thing is is you know, it's to me, it's and, and the reason I don't engage is it, it, it's 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 usually a firmly held position that's almost impossible to dislodge them from. Mm. Um, that it's all just calories and you know, a hundred calories of cookies is the same as a hundred calories of broccoli. Like in no physiologic textbook, would you ever find that? Like no doctor would ever say that, but they do, right? They, they, they're like, yeah, it's the same. It's the same. Cookies are as fattening as broccoli. Broccoli is the same as cookies. It's like, no, not at all. There's nothing the same. So please don't treat them the same, but they do. And, and because they have a, you know, they get supported by all the other supporters who are again, very into fitness and therefore wanting to flaunt that thinness as their superiority um, over other people. Right. And, and it's that sort of feeling that they feel that they're superior, but that anybody can do it. Therefore they're entitled to make fun of others. And mm. I don't, I don't like that. And it's, it's, you know, to me, it's, it's very distasteful and you see it. Some, some of these people are extremely like, um, you know, extremely negative towards other people. Like, and it gets them views. Like it gets them a lot of views. It gets them on the very prominent shows. And that's about it. Like that, that's great for them. I don't see that it's helpful for most people, but you know, they can do it if they like them. I don't tell them what to do. And we all just get along, you know, I mean, you help so many people and I'm sure that they help their tribe as well. I just, the vitriol within the online nutrition space, I think is sometimes, uh, Um, yeah, I agree with you because the thing is that if you look at, I mean, I have a lot of detractors about, you know, because what I talk about is a lot more nuanced than calories. It's all about calories. Uh, but I never say anything bad about any of those people who say that. And yeah. It's like, if you want to do that, go ahead. But they feel no compunction about saying bad things about me. Hmm. So they're like, oh, this guy's an idiot. This guy's a quack. I don't think I ever say that on my Twitter feed or anything. <laughs> it's it's not useful. It's not helpful. And if people want to believe something, they can believe something. It's not like if, if it works for you, good luck to you. I don't care either way. Like, yeah. but don't. Don't in, I'm not going to engage with them. I don't believe in that. But you see this negativity, and again, it's because it, it's it's the day you know it's the age of social media where all that super negativity gets you followers because they're like, oh, that's great. So then it encourages these people who just want to slag other people. It's like, but some people are helped by what I do. So you know, so why? Like some people are helped by what they say. So that's why I don't say anything bad about them. Like, what am I going to say? I don't respect them because they're just so negative all the time. But like, why do you need to do that? It's like, yeah, you help the people that you help. And I help the people that I help. And if they want to listen to me, that's fine. If they want to listen to you, that's fine too. I don't care. Like, I don't have anything to sell here, right? Like my, I, I, I have these podcasts, which are for free. And I do the YouTube, which people can watch for free. They can get my books, which you can get from the library. Or they tell you there's a ton of, you know, pirate copies of stuff out there. <laughs> I've seen them all, right? If you wanted to read any of the stuff, it's free. It's all on my blog. Everything in my book is on my blog and it's all free. So then they're like, oh he's selling something it's like what like you know it's all for free it's like you can you can do it if you like but it's you know but for them it's it's just a way of getting attracting attention it's it's very uh, unhelpful i think nutrition uh twitter and stuff is is it, it gets a little bit too much sometimes because of the vitriol it's 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 not necessary you don't need to do that I agree. I want to talk a little bit about basal metabolic rate because you mentioned it a few times and how the, you know, the calorie counting dieter is going to see a drop in their basal beta- metabolic rate, which is of course going to affect the calories outside of the calories in calories out equation. Um, I think a question that many people ponder is how do we increase, how do we 
improve our basal metabolic rate. I think yeah. there's this, um, this, uh, conception, maybe it's even a misconception that as we age our BMR, our basal metabolic rate tends to decline. Although there was a study that came out recently that showed that it wasn't really all that significant. Um, but yeah, talk yeah. to us about how we can increase so thing, our metabolic rates. Yeah. So increasing your metabolic rate, the, 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 the science behind that is much harder because you can't point to a study that says, Hey, you do this and your basal metabolic rate will go up. There's actually no studies that do that. Cause if it mm. was, everybody would know about it. It'd be a huge study. Um, but what we know for sure is that if you follow a calorie restricted diet, if you count your calories and cut out 500 calories a day, then pretty soon your body will burn 500 less. That's why your weight plateaus. There's no doubt about it. And this has been shown over and over and over again, at least for 15, 20, actually in the 90s. So at least for 25 years, we've known this to be true. And that original paper was Rudy Leibel in the New England Journal of Medicine, although the data actually goes up much much further than that. So minimum for 25 years, we've understood that if you simply count your calories, uh, keeping the same diet, your, your basal metabolic rate just goes down. And it's a survival response. Your body says, I'm eating 500 calories less. I'm going to burn 500 less so that I'm back in balance. I don't want a deficit. So that's why calorie counting doesn't work, despite what all the sort of gurus, the calorie gurus say. It almost always fails because they don't measure the calories out. That's what we know. How to make it go up is just a lot harder to to, to say on a um, on a um, you know there's no there's no data there. So after after that, it's really hard. I think one of the things that helps maintain it, and you get this from studies of fasting, is fasting. So fasting. And, and, and we know why. So what happens during fasting is that insulin tends to fall, but other hormones go up. So these are called counter-regulatory hormones. And sympathetic nervous tone, noradrenaline growth hormone are some of those counter-regulatory hormones and cortisol. So these ones are going to maintain your metabolic rate. So if you look at studies of fasting, uh, where they take people and fast them for four days, and they've done this, of course, and measure your metabolic rate. Um, and these are short-term, that's the problem. Uh, so at the beginning, you measure their metabolic rate at day zero, and you measure them after four days of no food. And you think that their metabolic rate will go down, but in fact, it goes up by about 10%. Mm. So that is very interesting because we know the mechanism, which is this counter-regulatory hormones. We know exactly why it should go up, and we know that it does go up. Right. And so that's very powerful. But what we don't have data really on is sort of fasting strategies that will make it go long term. So certain people do these fasting studies. And part of it um, is that some of these studies are done by people. They do fasting studies, but then they don't do it in a clinically meaningful way. That is what they do is they say, OK, you fast for 16 hours and then you eat whatever you want. It's like, you can't eat whatever you want. Like you can't fast for 18 hours or 16 hours and then eat just a whole bunch of junk food and, and you know, cookies and brownies. Like that ain't going to work. You're not going to lose weight like that. And then when they don't lose weight, they go, see, fasting doesn't work. It's like, <laughs> uh, you forgot that part where you actually let them eat whatever they want. Cause that was one of the studies that I've done on fasting that proved that fasting doesn't work. They, if you read this actual study, they actually let them eat ad libitum, which is a technical term for eat whatever you want. So we had no idea what they were eating. And unless you know what they're eating, you're not going to have any idea of whether they should lose weight or not. So fasting appears to be in the short term, a strategy that has some data behind it in terms of raising your metabolic rate, but nobody knows in the long term whether or not you can, what type of fasting strategy that looks like. Is it one meal a day? Is it extended fasting? Is it 16-8? What exactly is it? There's several studies where they've compared sort of calorie restriction to fasting, you know, um, on a on a uh, longer basis. And it there is a little bit of a drop in calorie um you know, uh, how many calories you use, but not as bad as calorie restriction. A calorie restriction really drops it a lot. Intermittent fasting strategies generally tend to drop it a little bit. 
So that's one sort of very interesting way to go about it um, because the there's there's a sort of a mechanism, a way that is plausible why your metabolic rate should go up during fasting. These counter-regulatory hormones, sympathetic nervous tone, noradrenaline, growth hormone, they should be supporting that metabolic rate. Um, and what you're doing is not you're you're not shutting down the body. What you're trying to do is flip the switch so that you're burning uh, body fat for energy and supplying you know the needs of the your body through the body fat as opposed to shutting the whole body down in the first place. From an evolutionary standpoint, I mean, why would the body's metabolic rate go up once food ceased to be available? Wouldn't it? I mean, it's yeah. kind of counterintuitive. Uh, no, actually, it's a very good survival strategy. There's a good reason for that because um, if there's no food and your body starts to shut down, so you lose concentration, you know, you have no energy. Well, so say you're a caveman, it's winter, there's no food, you don't eat for a day. Well, you have no energy, you can't focus. Uh, every day just becomes harder and harder to get food. You're going to die. So that doesn't happen. What happens is that the body is, like I said, it's just not that stupid. What it does is says, okay, I'm going to switch. I'm going to start using my stores of food. And then I'm going to pump up the system so that I'm going to give you lots of energy. I'm going to give you lots of concentration, you know, mental ability so you can go out and find food. You think about the hungry wolf. The hungry wolf is not like, oh, I'm about to keel over and die. I can't focus, right? The hungry wolf is zoned in and ready to sprint after food, right? So you don't want to, you know, what you're saying, which sort of makes sense at first, is that when you are hungry, you should be lethargic and lose concentration. It's actually the total opposite. It's a survival mechanism. Right? You think about Thanksgiving, you ate a huge meal. Do you feel really energized or do you want to just sit on the couch for a while and watch some TV? Right? If you're really hungry, like, oh, I'm hungry for something. Does that mean that you know, I'm hungry for success? I'm hungry for a promotion. Does that mean that you're lethargic and unfocused? No. It means you're zoned in and ready to do whatever it takes. So that's what the hunger means because we know um, that the hunger gives you this energy, gives you this focus gives you this ability to concentrate. That's why there's that expression. But we know why. Again, it's these counter-regulatory hormones. So no, it's not, um, it's, it, 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 you know, it's, it's, it seems a little counterintuitive at first. You'd think, oh, you'd want to conserve your energy. And that does happen probably when your body fat stores go down very low. Hmm. Your, your body fat stores have like 200,000 calories. Why would you say, I'm going to start shutting down the machine? <laughs> it's like, why don't you just use all this stuff? It's, it's, it's like if you have, you know, a coal burning plant, right? You burn, you know, a hundred tons of coal for energy. You have this huge warehouse that's busting full with like 300 days of, of coal. And you don't get your shipment of coal that day. What do you do? Okay, shut it down, boys. Power down. It's a blackout. Or... You just go into your stores, take it out and say, here's today's allotment because why else would you have body fat? That's what it's there for. Let your body use it up and it can do it without the detrimental effects of the calorie restriction, which is a very artificial sort of constraint. Like it's not a natural way to lose weight. People didn't count calories in the past and yet they still stayed slim. Like it doesn't make any sense that we have to count our calories in order to stay slim like the margin of error is so low in terms of most people's weight gain. So anyway, that's the sort of um, the evolutionary side of things as to why the hunger, assuming you have adequate body uh, fat, is, is actually something that's going to make you more energized, is going to give you more focus and keep your metabolic rate high. Yeah. You haven't really talked much about, about, macros it seems like you're the the primary argument that you're making is that people should really look to increase the quality of the foods that they're consuming and to steer away from ultra processed industrially created shelf stable packaged convenience foods um yeah. and to steer more towards towards whole foods minimally processed foods foods with one or two ingredients in it am i exactly. is that an accurate statement yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that the problem when you start getting into macros, and again, it's not that macros are unimportant. The problem is when you say, oh, I need 
this percent this fat or carbs or whatever. Then you start making trade offs by eating unprocessed foods. So you say you want a high protein diet, and you can only get there by taking processed whey powder. It's like, okay, but now you're trading off here. You're getting high protein, but you're taking an ultra processed food. Or if you want low fat, but to do low fat, you have to eat ultra processed foods that removes all the fat and put something else instead in. Or you want low carb, but then you go to a low carb food that sticks all this other stuff in. Well, now you're making trade-offs, right? So once you start saying the macros are the most important, then you start accepting that you can process foods to make them closer to the to hit those macros. And that may not be a good trade-off, right? I think in most cases, it's not a good trade-off. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, well, we don't have a lot of time left. Uh, you know, this has been this has been fascinating. Um, and uh, I'm really glad that you, you know, that we were able to have this conversation. Um, I just want to talk a, b- a little bit about exercise, I guess, before we wrap, um, resistance training, uh, that's, I mean, that's, uh, an exercise modality that I've long thought as being something that can help boost metabolism, um, and, uh, and, and help preserve one's basal metabolic rate as one diets. Is that, um, something that you Keeping- routinely prescribe? Uh, one, I think resistance exercise is actually extremely beneficial for most people. Um, and probably one of the things that got ignored in the whole cardio boom, right, is to not do weights. I think that's actually a mistake. I think you should probably do both. However, um, the, the thing about the metabolic rate is that when you do resistance exercise, you are only focused on skeletal muscle. So you can exercise and, and it will raise your metabolic rate. Like if you have more muscle, then you are going to need more calories for that. But just keep in mind that there's a whole lot of other stuff that you're not influencing with that skeletal muscle. So you're not influencing your heart, your liver, your kidney, your brain, your brain may or may not burn more calories as you exercise, right? Your uh, body heat generation, that's like a huge amount of you know, calories that it needs to generate body heat. Like you take these swimmers, for example, they're in cold water for hours, these Olympic swimmers. That's why they eat a lot of food. Hmm. They have to, because they're immersed in cold water. Their bodies have to generate heat all the time. So the thing is that, well, resistance exercise, I agree with you, very good for you. And it does play a small role in, in metabolic rate. It can't do anything for everything else, like body heat, brain, heart, liver, kidneys, smooth muscles, you know, your lungs. Like it, it doesn't do anything for the how much energy those use. So yes, you are affecting the one system, the skeletal muscle system, but you're not affecting the other sort of like 10 systems that also use energy in the body, some of which are much, much higher than the amount of muscle you carry. Like body temperature, for example, like if you, you, if you live in a very cold, um, temperature and you don't wear clothes, then yeah, you're going to need a lot of calories to generate that body heat. I mean, I don't know if you've ever watched some of these shows like naked and alive, like one of the shows there in this cold weather and they're just burning calories. Like you couldn't believe because there is so much body heat generation going on. They couldn't exercise because they had to save their calories, right? It was, it was, uh, because they, they, they had not much to eat, but they're just losing weight at an incredible rate because they could, they had to generate heat to stay alive, which necessitated burning just a ton of weight. So yes, I, I, I you know, yes, exercise important resistance exercise, I think very, um, very important too, but you know, overall for metabolic rate, it's only one of a number of systems. Well, what are some other tools in the toolkit? I mean, I'm glad you mentioned cold water thermogenesis. Um, are there other uh, modalities that can that can be used to boost the metabolic rate of, you know, of of the vital organs of the brain? Um, do you do you recommend to patients that they spend more time in cooled environments? Um, I don't. I don't know that there's a lot of data in it. Cold um, environments and, you know, some people really believe it. Um, it has a few advantages that 
you know, it's not super comfortable. So I don't know how <laughs> much people will take it up anyway. But, um, you know, there's this whole data on the browning of white fat that is really very interesting. Um, so, you know, most fat is this, this white fat, which is just a storage, but you have this brown fat, which you can actually turn, you can turn, you, you know, white fat into brown fat through sort of cold adaptation. Uh, and it will start to actually generate heat. And that's one of the things that's going to take a lot of energy. So presumably it will be very beneficial for you if you are spending a lot of time in cold, uh, temperatures, but you know, it's like, I think that's probably useful if you really wanted to take it to that extreme, I think it would be good for you. Um, but you know, on a population basis, you know, you've got 70 year old people with five medications. It's like, am I really going to tell them to dunk themselves in cold water? Um, you know, I, I don't know that they do that, but, uh, it's probably useful. <laughs> yeah. Being a kidney doctor has made you a realist because like people are not going to, it's, it's, it's the crazy people like me and, and others in the sort of, you know, online health and wellness, again, selection bias, right? We're highly motivated. We're interested in this. We like putting ourselves through environmental sources of hormetic stress, but for your average person, um, I think you're right. It's kind of a, it's kind of a big ask to, uh, to ask them to willingly subject themselves to cold ambient temperatures. Yeah. I mean, it's just a different population. Like you got to understand. And I think this is, you know, a lot of people who attack me just don't understand that the people I'm treating are not like a 20 year old with like, you know, they want to go from 6% to 4% body fat. It's like, no, a lot of these people have arthritis. A lot of people have chronic pain. They have chronic medical conditions. It's like, you know, putting them on very intensive things is, is not, they can't do it. Like it's, it's, it's because they, you have, there's a lot of other things they have to, they have to deal with. Like they might have gout and, and they can't do it. Like, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's just not doable. So you have to be a realist in terms of what they can and can't do. Like they have so much discomfort in their lives and I'm going to put them into more discomfort. I could, but will they do it? Like, uh, unless there's clear evidence that it's going to benefit them. It's like, it, it'd be a big ask. That's all. That makes sense. Weren't there a few studies that showed that just drinking water can increase metabolic rate? Um, Maybe that's if you're dehydrated. It would probably be small, I, I, I would guess. Hmm. It'd be a small effect. I mean, most of us drink water. I mean, sometimes these these studies get blown out of proportion because it's like, you know, but we all drink water. It's like, it's not a new thing. So it's like, if, if it had a huge effect, I'd probably know about it. Like we'd all know about it. <laughs> we all drink water. Yeah. Drinking water, probably not the solution to the obesity crisis. Although when you're deep, <laughs> when you're dehydrated, you tend yeah. to get hungry. Um, which is very interesting. If you consider the fact that, you know, for a hunter gatherer, when water ceased to be available, where is the next place that they would look for their water hydration needs? Food. Yeah. Yeah. So, that's true. Yeah. You gotta, gotta stay hydrated. Hey guys, if you enjoyed that conversation, you're going to love this one. So I'm excited to have a conversation with you about what people are getting wrong when it comes to weight loss. Mm -hmm. And one argument that I've heard you make that is that weight loss isn't really about food. Yeah. Funny, right? Uh, yeah. Counter, counterintuitive, counter Quite. to the counter to the entire market of weight loss <laughs> <laughs> is that it would be actually all about the food, and that that this market should be able to tell you, hey, if you just eat this, you'll be fine. Um, you know, I I personally lost sixty five pounds. I've been keeping those off for over ten years, wow. and uh, I was a very I, I was that consumer, right? Who just believed, okay, there's going to be this magic food plan, or if I only did this, you know, I would be okay. Um, but I was always then eating things that I didn't enjoy, I didn't like, and there was no longevity there. So eventually, I would fall away from that food plan back into my old behaviors and habits. So, um, you know, after years in the weight loss industry, years in behavior modification research, um, and years working with clients to lose weight, I really realized that it was never ever that I worked with somebody who said to me, oh, I don't know what I should be eating. 
like they could literally lay out a day of perfect meals for me. Oh, I should probably have a yogurt and a berries for breakfast. I should probably have some salad and some chicken. For, you know, they could give me a perfect meal plan. But what they couldn't do was tell me what behaviors were standing in the way of them actually making sustainable change. So knowing what to eat for breakfast is fine, but if you don't get up on time, if you consistently get up too late, if you consistently don't prepare, right? If you consistently, um, you know, stay up uh, too late, if you consistently eat after dinner, these are behaviors that lead to weight gain over time. And so it was never the knowledge like about, or that they couldn't Google search what's the perfect meal plan. I mean, that's simple. The real work in weight loss is in examining your habit loops and the, the behavior patterns and your environment to discover what's triggering you to go through these loops of unhealthy behavior, then dismantling them literally one at a time. So it's a totally different process than people actually have been led to believe. I love that. I mean, because ultimately weight loss, what it takes to achieve weight loss can be boiled down to uh, a very simple mathematical truth, right? Like uh, create a sustainable calorie deficit for yourself. And I feel like everybody kind of knows that. Yeah. So if everybody knows that, how come we're all, we're, we're walking around in a time where two thirds of American adults are either overweight or obese? Yeah. And, and, and they, they, they actually believe that that by 2030, right, that that's going to be critical, like 90% of our country will be. And I think the secrets around uh, what the truth is around our environment at this point and understanding a little bit more about your brain and how your brain works and drives you towards eating and overeating, and then understanding that we have a, uh, a food environment and food manufacturers who have been studying you and your brain for many, many years behind the scenes. They pay, you know, scientists millions of dollars to understand what will get you to not be able to say no, to trigger you to eat, and then to trigger you to not be able to stop eating. So I think once I illuminate that for people and they start to realize there's nothing wrong with them, that like, that's like one of my famous taglines. There's like nothing wrong with you. You just were never told the truth. You're being bounced like a ping pong ball all around by triggers in your environment and the way that people want you to behave. Uh, and once you start to notice, oh my gosh, wow, I am programmed to eat. Every time I see food, smell food, or even talk about food, we're programmed to want to eat food. That's just how we're wired. Your brain is wired that way to make you survive because we didn't have enough food at, at, at certain points in our development. So now we're in an environment where we see food, smell food, talk about food, watch food TV, um, have pantries, live in the Zoom world where I can go downstairs and eat in, in 30 seconds, I can have food in my hand and I'm bored and I'm in one, the same environment. So once you realize those triggers and that the hunger that you think you're experiencing is physiological, you will actually think you're hungry. You will have your mouth water. You might even have your stomach grumble, but you only ate like 10 minutes ago. Your body is sending false hunger signals. So learning that those triggers are occurring, that you can manage them and seeing, oh my God, it's because I came downstairs and saw my kid eating a peanut butter and jelly that I then said, oh, I want to get a peanut butter and jelly. Wow. Well, at this point, you've made it to the top of the mountain. You've achieved the holy grail of sustainable weight loss. You've worked with many, many, many clients over the years. You've written, you know, a number of great books, including Target 100. Um, but tell me about your own journey, uh, your own personal journey. As I understand it, you've had uh, your own experience with yo-yo dieting and the like. Can you can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that's that's what I always want people to know when they when they listen to me. I'm coming from a place of truly understanding what you're feeling. I was an overweight child. I, I you know I was in a diet program by the time I was 12. Um, and I think what that does, you know, is it sets you up for feeling like you're not good enough, 
right? Basically something is wrong with you and, and the whole world kind of tells you that this is something that should be simple. You should just eat less like, and move more, right? So I think that set me up for a lot of you sort of feeling like I was constantly chasing a better version of myself. So that sent me through this sort of diet spiral. I did, you know, uh, several diets. I lost 30 pounds, maybe five times. It escalated to 50, then it escalated to 65. Just the way that we see this happening for people all over the world now, which is when they get into that diet mentality and the diet culture, that there is no reversal. It's a spiraling up. Each one, each weight gain is more and more and more. So I lived that um, and, and really experienced that, the pain, uh, the emotional pain, the physical pain, um, and the guilt and shame that lives around carrying weight. So it's kind of become my life's work to illuminate you know, what's really happening for you instead of like, what's wrong with you and why, why can't you do this? Um, but that there are real physiological things going on. There's real brain science that you can leverage to, uh, put, put, to put this in your favor. Um, so, so I think that's sort of uh, at least a little history. Um, I then, you know, I, I was an actress actually for, for many years. And, oh, wow. uh, yeah. So as a professional actress, I have a master's degree in opera. I was in big Broadway musicals like Les Miserables that just exacerbated, right. The diet mentality of being an actress and needing to look a certain way. Um, when I finally left there, I went to Weight Watchers to, um, lose the weight. I was just a, a customer there, ended up working my way all the way up through the ranks to uh, executive level where I was the celebrity weight loss coach for people like Jennifer Hudson and Jessica Simpson and Charles Barkley, Katie Couric, Al Roker, you know, just really helping high level folks that gave me a lot of exposure. Um, but I never stopped leading the meetings on the ground level of Weight Watchers. So I was always helping everyday people, I was always working at weight loss myself. So I felt like I really was getting that insight. Um, I stayed there for about 11 years. And then I started my own company and have been working uh, in, in every single place that I could that was an offshoot of the entire wellness sphere in my mind, but specifically in technology, because I really believe in the power of technology and science to change this, the course of, of what's going on right now. So, so yeah, so I've then written Target 100 and um, am now developing a, a brand new uh, platform and uh, way of thinking about weight loss. I love that. I think, you know, you, you've had the privilege of, of getting to work with some pretty household names. I think what separates them from average people is that the people that A-list or, you know, A-list celebrities, they're highly motivated because their livelihood depends on them getting in a certain shape, but average, we'll just, you know, use the term average people who are not, or civilians who are not working in Hollywood, who are not singers, actors, um, they don't necessarily have that kind of motivation. And I think that it, it makes things much more difficult for them at the end of the day. And that's where I think motivation is like, uh, where motivation, you know, motivation, inspiration, people who rely on motivation, inspiration, I think it's, it's almost setting yourself up for failure. You know, you have to kind of bring in, bring, bring discipline, I think, into the equation. Is that, yeah. would you say that's an accurate statement? You know, I, I, I love that. I like that we're talking about motivation because motivation is like this mystery term and people think like, oh, they're going to wait around for it. It's just going to magically appear or like, remember that time when I was so motivated? Why can't I get that back? Like, it's like something that's going to drop in on them, right? Um, and why can they not control it? I, I, I totally, I, I try to reframe um, motivation for people and, and really teach them that, that sustainable weight loss is about identifying behavior shifts and identifying what behavior shifts am I working on right now, right? So maybe there are three small things you're working on. Like I'm going to put my gym clothes out at night so that when I wake up, they're there. Um, and that helps me. Um, cause you're not going to wake up and just be motivated to go to the gym. Like people think that that's what it's going to feel like. And I train people that know 
habit formation is a series of triggering a routine, understanding what the reward is from that routine, and also understanding that it doesn't feel good to change a habit. No one talks about that. Like getting up and deciding I'm going to create a gym routine. It's not, it does, you feel uncomfortable. You don't want to do it. You're getting up early. But if you get up early, put the shoes on, walk out the door, go to the gym, the first week's terrible. The second week's less terrible. Third week, all of a sudden, it's like your brain is going, this is what we do. And it becomes your go-to rote behavior over time until you can't not do it. Where I think people fail is thinking that it's going to feel good and that they're just going to become motivated because they're so angry or dissatisfied with the way that they feel in their lives that it's going to magically appear. It does not. It's just like work. You don't go into work and a a project just gets done. You break it down into tiny shifts, right? Tiny steps. And you go and you move that ball down the field. And then eventually you get that project to a place where it is rolling and it gets completed. So I don't want people to live in the space of this magical mystery motivation anymore. Yeah, I think you so eloquently described the conundrum with inertia, right? Like an object in motion wants to stay in motion. Yes, yes. An object at rest wants to stay at rest. Mm-hmm. And, and, all, and of course, we also have evolution fighting against us yes. in the sense that, you know, we don't, we're not really inclined to want to exercise. We're inclined, I think, more accurately to want to conserve energy. And then, of course, to reproduce, to procure food um, and the like. But ex- exercising is something that goes against millennia of of evolution. So how do we create healthier habits for ourselves? Well, I think that's that, that everyone, just like I said, everybody, when I talk to them and say like, name what you should eat. When I ask that question, tell me three small behaviors that are standing in the way of your weight loss. And they will immediately pop into, well, I'm, I'm basically, while I'm making the kids dinner, I'm eating a full dinner while I'm getting the dinner ready. Or, oh, I'm eating after dinner, or I skip breakfast and then I get overly hungry and I overeat at lunch. I mean, they are clear as a bell. So I I feel like if anyone's listening to this, jot down three small things that you personally know, like wandering downstairs at four o'clock when I'm tired and going to the pantry and foraging through and eating chocolate. And then it, you know, spiraling into the chips, whatever it is, Mm -hmm. jot them down, then examine what could I do to change that? What could I do to trigger a new behavior? And, and I ask people to get, to get their, their own attention. Because what a lot of people don't understand is that once you create a habit, it moves to a back portion of your brain where it's, you're really not conscious that you're doing it. So halfway through being in the pantry, you're like, oh, darn myself, why did I do this? You weren't even there for, for the whole trip down the stairs. You're kind of like thinking about work or you're thinking about whatever's happening in your day. And then all of a sudden you get there, you start eating and you don't wake up until it's, it's halfway over. So I'll say to someone, you know what, close the door to your pantry, put a giant post-it note, a big, bright pink post-it note that says no snacking today. Because if you don't trigger, if you don't stop the loop, it's like being on the road and driving somewhere and getting there because you've driven there so many times. You go, oh, how did I even get here? I wasn't even present for that. So I, I really encourage people to begin to think, how can I either, you know, trigger myself not to do something or trigger myself to do something, creating a new routine. And you'll get down there and your whole brain and your whole body will be like, but it is four o'clock. I need a snack. I'm tired. I'm hungry. I'm this. And it's going to be highly uncomfortable. And that's when you need to learn to sort of really push into the new routine, right? Put the gym clothes on, go. I don't care if you go to the gym for five minutes, because what you're doing is creating the routine of putting the clothes on, walking out the door and getting there. And then, you know, same thing with the four o'clock snack. I don't care if the biggest win for you was that you got down there, you walked outside, you took five deep breaths, but you couldn't get past it. You still wanted the snack, but you're going to say that for the first week, that's all I'm capable of. And next week I'm going to walk out the door five steps and around the block. And, and, and divert 
and continue to divert and divert and divert until your body no longer tells you, the brain no longer says at four o'clock, it doesn't put you in the loop where you're totally so unconscious to go downstairs and do this. So I hope I'm being super clear that you've got to have a trigger. Then you have to follow through, even though there is discomfort. Um, understand that if you're uncomfortable, you're doing it right. That's, that's the part. So, so well put. I think w- one of the major reasons why people, or <laughs> I'll just speak for myself, I, I tend to want to snack either when I'm bored or when I've had a stressful stimulus that sends me to the kitchen looking for a quick dopamine hit. So in lieu of the snack, what can people do to satisfy either or both of those two um, motivators? Yeah, and you're, you're expressing something that, that is so important for people to understand, right? So I talked about physical cues, right? You could see food and, need, and want to eat it. There are other triggers. You just named some. Some people call it emotional eating. I don't love that term because it makes it sound like you were crying in a corner and like you didn't, you were emotionally having food. But what you clearly stated was there is a payoff. When you eat food, there is a dopamine serotonin release that takes place. So you've made quite a smart choice. You're feeling a negative feeling or even a positive one because sometimes we do it in celebration mode. You've then figured out a routine that makes that negative feeling go away, which is your reward. So when sometimes just a thought or a feeling can become the trigger for the routine of eating. So I think where you also were very clear is what could I, what could I divert with, right? So I said that, or what could I insert since this routine isn't working for me? This routine is making me gain weight. What routine could I do, you know? Personally, I can say I I struggled during uh, the pandemic because I had a very active job in and out of the city, carrying a book bag up and down stairs of New York City, running all over the place, traveling. And now I'm sitting in this room and sitting here and not moving made the stress higher. And I'd go downstairs and I would either overeat or have a cocktail to take the, the, the temperature down. And it became a loop. And so, you know, I realize, right, I see those loops. So I need people to understand and see themselves. There's nothing wrong with you. I'm not a bad person. I just created a really smart loop that was relieving my stress. Then I said, that's not going to work for me long term to stay in this loop. And I created the loop of put the leash on the dog and step outside and walk, walk around the, you know, walk, do a 20 minute walk. So, so that's an example. Each of us has to discover what it is that will quell the feeling that we're trying to um, to run from, right? So if it's boredom, you know, maybe that is, you know, okay, I'm going to call a friend. Uh, if that is, um, you know, stress and anxiety, maybe that is, you know, I'm going to get outside and take five deep breaths, or I'm going to stretch for five minutes or whatever that is. So it's about identifying all super helpful. I've heard you talk uh, in the past about the value of hydration <laughs> to uh, to sustainable weight loss. Talk to me about that. Oh, there you go. Drink sure. What is it? What's what's in the cup? Just plain water all day nice. long. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, I always say hydration is my superpower. Um, we are made up of water, right? So in average, we're about sixty eight percent water. But our really important like brain and heart and the things that really run our metabolism are over 75% water. So when you're dehydrated, I mean, a few things happen. Usually you actually crave food because if you think about it, if you think back to how we survived when we couldn't find a water source, we found food like leaves and plants and berries that had water, water in them. So We tend to feel hungry when we're actually thirsty. And when people don't understand the habit of staying hydrated throughout the day, they um, end up kind of mistaking those two. Also your whole metabolic system, your whole system runs on water. So without it, you really begin to see a reduction in metabolism. So it is a, a boost and you will find that 
energy and mood and the way your skin looks and all of these things, because you're made of water, it just sort of brings you into this space of just being able to handle stress better, sleeping better, like all of that stuff that, that might have made you eat now is reduced by X percent. Wow. What are some other uh, acceptable ways of hydrating for people who you know, maybe get bored of water? Is, is sparkling water a good yeah. sort of sec- yeah. second option? Wonderful. You know, I always say I'm I, in my book, I, I, I ask people to aim for a hundred ounces of water in a day, which I think like people think that's a lot. It's really actually not that very, not that much when you start looking at it. I tell people like you can count some of your coffee for that. You can count some sparkling water or tea because there's water in there. Um, I try to get people to go about 70 to 75% true water and then, you know, sprinkle in those other drinks that will bring you a little joy uh, in your life. But hydration is my favorite pillar in my book because it is the clearest example of, of, of habit formation is, you know, you see me, I've got this bright yellow cup on my desk. I am so habitual, right? That I go downstairs, I get my little reading glasses, I pick up my computer, I get my notebook and I fill my water. I'm not even present for that anymore because, and now it sits here and it triggers me all day and and it's sitting there and I see it. So I go, oh, drink it, right? So it's a clear habit loop, trigger, routine, reward. I love it. I love water. Uh, drink it all the time. Also love sparkling water. Um, yes, I love, I love spark. I love sparkling water with a little bit of, sometimes I buy a flavored sparkling water, like orange flavored sparkling water. And I'll put some, just like some stevia drops in through the can yes. hole and yes. it becomes, yeah, it's so good. It becomes like a calorie free soda. It's almost better than soda because most sodas are too, even diet sodas are too, they're too sweet. So sweet. And well, now I've become the queen of a mocktail because like a, a little bit of kombucha, like a watermelon kombucha with seltzer, fresh limes, a few fresh raspberries thrown in there. Um, and then, you know, just really sitting with that in a wine glass was another way that I moved away from the need for a cocktail. Um, and, or if I was going to have one, it could spread those out. So I would have, you know, my mocktail first, then maybe have a glass of wine, then I have a glass of water, then a glass of wine. So I'm so with you of like, there's so many fun ways to stay hydrated. So try to enjoy it. You know, it's. Yeah. yeah. I love that. So a lot of people listening to this episode of the show probably are going to have come through the ringer of diet culture, having tried overly restrictive diet after overly restrictive diet. What do you make of those? What do you make of like the low carb, you know, diet camp, the low fat diet camp, and where should people conceptualize situating themselves when it comes to, you know, a sustainable weight loss pattern? That's so, that's such a great question. And it actually hurts my heart to think about people going through that. Um, and, and that was the purpose behind writing Target 100 is, you know, I, I've been in the diet industry for over 20 years. I've worked behind the curtain in those, in, in some of the largest companies in the world. And to know what I know now and to wish to, to share with people, weight loss does not have to hurt. It does not have to be this massive departure from where you are right now. In fact, you know, what the first chapter in my book is, it says, start with breakfast. I can see is like, if people just say, I'm going to take a week and I'm going to focus on getting breakfast straight. I'm going to just outline five breakfasts that I like, not that some other person outside of me, some RD who wrote this food plan with me, not in mind, they don't know that I'm allergic to this and I'm you know, maybe, you know, I'm from this culture and I eat these foods culturally. They don't know anything about you. And they've just put this plan out there for you to sit down and go, you know, what? I do. I love, um, you know, uh, avocado toast and I could do a slice of bread and a little bit of cheese and some avocado and an egg or, oh, I love Greek yogurt and, and, and write those down and work on just breakfast for a week of things you like. And then you're going to actually see weight loss. I sort of have another famous saying of, I always say, just give me a B. I think everyone thinks in weight loss, you have to be perfect. And if you make one error, then you have made a mistake and you are therefore out of the, you're out of the diet. So you go running back to your old habits and behaviors because you didn't stick perfectly to that. 
And my teaching is always like, it was never about the fact that you had one out of the pocket meal. It was about the fact that you felt bad about that. You got the guilt and shame spiral going, which then actually, when we look at the brain under an MRI, guilt and shame highlights the reward system. So Mm. we go feeling guilt and shame about having the ice cream cone to actually just saying, well, I guess it's over. I'm just going to eat anything I want because I I already messed it up. And I instead teach uh, really what I call the art of recovery, right? The art of recovering from a perceived mistake because it wasn't, no one gained weight from an ice cream cone. They gained weight from turning that ice cream cone into a them being a bad person, which is all diet mentality, which is like the inability to be outside of black and white thinking. And I'm teaching gray zone, understanding that it's all about like saying, you know what, that's cool. I ate one ice cream cone. I didn't eat the whole carton and I enjoyed it. I was with my family. It was a beautiful summer day. I'm so grateful. I got a great breakfast plan for tomorrow morning. So it's so much more loving and easy and kind than the industry wants to make it out because if they, if they don't make it that way, then you believe you need them to understand your own success and you don't. So my book is all about you writing your own weight loss program, which that's the one that sticks. When I'm eating the food I like, when I'm doing the exercise I like, when I'm actually understanding my behavior, not not just trying to fit myself into some behavior that's been been set on top of me, I can do that forever because it's mine. So it's a real juxtaposition of that diet industry and, and the control and the deprivation and the restriction that, that people have been, been made to believe they need to do. So, and being in the industry for this many years, like you asked about low carb and all this, I have seen it all. (laughs) Literally we went from carbs are bad to fats are bad to now, you know, it's everything. And I don't even know what comes next. I don't know where we go after keto, right? Like just, it's, you know, whoa, you know, but really figuring out um, and saying, okay, we just keep spiraling through this. How about if I spend time and, and really examine, you know, for some people eating a higher fat diet really makes them feel great and it's right for them. And people can spend the time and figure that out that, wow, when I do have that eggs and cheese, maybe an omelet for breakfast, I really, God, I'm not hungry for a long time. And I have a lot of energy. Whereas some people really thrive on a little higher carb breakfast. So playing around and figuring out what you respond to and not just putting a blanket over the top um, to, and jumping on that next fad diet, because some of them are even downright dangerous. So, you know, taking back the control, I think is really important. Yeah. I, I mean, I couldn't agree more. I definitely, you know, I'm, I'm grateful that we have these different sort of diets out there that people can sort of like a buffet, like a Vegas yes. buffet pick from, you know, yes. try out, right. Try it. If it doesn't work for you, you know, that that's not the diet for you. And, but then at the other end of the spectrum, at least from my vantage point, you know, I've come across a number of, uh, health, you know, quote unquote, health experts or, or diet experts on social media, many of them actually RDs that, I mean, the, the message from, from my vantage point may as well be eat whatever you want. Just don't eat too much of it, mm-hmm. which I don't think necessarily is all that helpful either. Um, so where do you sit sort of in the, uh, you know, in, in terms of when it comes to actually like the, the recommendations for what people should actually be eating other than, you know, eat what you like. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the, the pillar, the guideline that I give in target 100 came after a lot of research and after a lot of thought, um, and after a lot of dieting myself and, and I am, I call myself a diet Guinea pig. Every, every new diet that comes out, I fully, I gain 10 pounds, 10, 12 pounds. And then I work on, I use that diet, um, so that I understand what, what people are going through. So, um, I have a lot of diet experience uh, (laughs) is what I'm saying. Uh, And I I came up with a guideline of to aim for around 100 grams of carbs a day. So that is a very moderate amount of carbohydrates. You can have some, you know, carbs with your breakfast. You could have a slice of, of toast. You could maybe have some rice with dinner. It's nothing crazy, 
but it, like you said, creates moderation. Yeah. And what we know to be true is that the packaged foods and the processed foods and sugar are what are killing you, not fats like we thought for so long you know like all of that has all been debunked you know the eggs and the cholesterol coming from food sources like all of that we now know to be not real so coming back into that space of going okay i'm going to find out around 100 grams of carbs and i i call it my whole thing is ish right cuz you may 110 grams of carbs you're still losing weight 120 whereas the person sitting next to you it might be 80 so this is a real experimentation um, and it's it's really around not feeling like, ever feeling like a failure, right? So I think what happens to people, like you have like a really healthy outlook on those diets, but for, for most people, as they go through a diet, they go in with this high expectation and hope that this is going to be the one that fixes me. Hmm. When it doesn't last or they don't like it or they don't, it's a crushing failure in their mind. And I'm like you. And what I always counsel people on is like, that was a good experience. You should be really excited. You had that experience. Now you probably picked up two or three great meals from that. Like maybe you did find out that you love omelets and that you crafted a few. Let's put them in the basket of your weight loss program. And let's be grateful for every thing that we tried because it gave us more information about what's right for you. So it's a, it's a different perspective. And I hope if people are listening um, and they have felt that way um, because I work with so many people and they express like, I can't fail again. And I can't, there is no failure, right? It was all effort. Um, and you, you went in, there is a, an, another saying that every action has a positive intention. So every single action you take, even when it doesn't pan out the way you thought it, you actually went in with a positive intention. So giving yourself that credit that you didn't go in to, to, to cycle through a, yet another diet, you went in because you wanted to try. And I, I applaud people for trying without judgment. Uh, I just hope that they will not beat themselves up um, if it doesn't really fit them, but take what, take what you like and bring it along. Couldn't agree more. I think part of the reason why people do tend to beat themselves up if they can't adhere to diet XYZ is that the purveyors of those diets tend to promote very black or white thinking about those diets. Like yes. you can only lose weight if you follow a strict ketogenic diet, which we know is not true. You don't have to do a ketogenic diet to lose fat. You don't have to do a low carb diet. People lose lots of weight on low fat diets. Yeah. So it's, it's really about finding, I think what works for you. And I like the 100 gram of carb heuristic because it's very moderate. It's very moderate, but it also skims off the top, I think, a large portion of what are typically empty calories in, you know, in the context of the standard American diet, your average American today eats what, like 300 grams of carbohydrates a day. 300 is, is very average right now. Yeah. And, and, you know, recommended 25 grams of sugar a day. Uh, most people are eating hundreds, 200, you know, like it's just unbelievable. So just even taking an eye and, and that's why, you know, target 100 is all about this holistic vision of like, yeah, we can talk about the food pillar all day and food is, is critical. So, so, you know, we started and I said like food, it's not about food. It's, it, it is about behavior, but food is very critical. And I think it is the place for people to start because what we know about weight loss is if you can start there to examine that it's where, you know, it's where you're most comfortable. And then I, I kind of work you in these other pillars of hydration and movement, exercise, stress, and sleep. Because if you don't address those six things, it's not just about a food plan. You're not going to be successful if, if it's ruling your life. And you gave a great example. You know, we put food in on stress. If we don't learn to manage our stress without using food, we're going to eventually fall off of that food plan and go back to using food as our stress reliever because it is the go-to habit and behavior that is running our lives. So I think it's really important to think about food, but also expand it out into this place of a more holistic view um, so that when that food plan fails, you know, that's why these six pillars, often people say to me, they're like, I really enjoy this plan because I have six, I have six opportunities for success. You know, my food wasn't great today, but I took that 10,000 step walk in the afternoon and I went and I went to bed on time and I drank my water. 
And sometimes those three pillars can give you as much weight loss as food. I start you with food because that's where you think you need to start. And because food can give you success off the bat, right? By changing a few things. What we know about weight loss is for you to see weight loss in the earliest stages of a weight loss program is where you begin to get real hooked on it because you're like, oh, okay, I can do this. And it wasn't that bad. So, so that's why I often tell people focus on, focus on your food because that's where you're comfortable and it'll give you some success. Then move on into these other pillars. And when I tell you, I have a, a worksheet that I'm sort of famous for called the wheel and all six of them are laid out in a wheel in perfect symmetry. Because in my mind, not a single one of them is less important. So it's not like food takes up three quarters of the wheel and the others are squished into one quarter. If you aren't getting to bed on time, if you're not getting your recommended, the, you have a, a huge gap in your ghrelin and your leptin hormone that you're going to be starving all day. Your body and your brain, basically you're, they look at your brain and they're not sure if you actually smoked pot or if you just didn't get sleep and you will have the munchies. So sleep is like so underrated in weight loss. So, you know, I just want to open people's minds that, you know, get out of that diet hole of, of it being about a food plan and you not having any control over this and, and, and that it can be as simple as like getting in bed and going to sleep, but which is like the greatest thing in the world for me, you know? So what would you say is one of the most important things uh, or the most important thing that people can do to optimize uh, their sleep? I, I really think it's about, oh, can, I, can I say a couple of them? Yeah, please. Oh the God. more the merrier. Yeah. I think um, people overconsume caffeine hmm. at this point. Um, it's become very, you know, acceptable to, to drink a lot of caffeine. I think people don't realize how that's disrupting them. I think thinking through that, I think, you know, being hydrated is, a, is an excellent way to have your systems running and, and be more, you know, aware. Um, I think your sleep environment is critical. Uh, you know, having it be dark enough, be pleasant, um, removing screens from your, from your sleep environment, um, but also just triggering right? Triggering the routine and creating a routine around bedtime. I feel, I hear a lot of people, I mean, social media is making people suffer right now because they just get into this habit loop uh, mm. of, of getting on there and then they, they go or they get on Netflix or whatever it is. Um, I think it's about really having those triggers that say, this is, this is when I turn these things off and I, I move into a mode where I am going to let my body understand that we're moving into another phase of our day. Right now, it's just all sort of mushing together for people. Um, so delineating this, this, this restful portion, I think is really critical. What do you say to somebody who's listening who just can't believe that it's the way that they sleep or the time that they get to bed has any bearing on their weight loss journey? <laughs> I'd say, look at the science. I mean, what we know, as I say, so we will look at somebody's hormone levels when they sleep less, you know, less than around seven hours a, a, a night, right? So you're, I'm going to always go back to the ish uh, is that, you know, some people are fine with six and a half. Some people need eight, some people need nine. You got to do the work and figure out what your formula is for sleep. And then you got to like, I protect mine with my life because what we know from looking at your hormone levels of someone who's sleeping less than those seven hours, your ghrelin hormone is actually elevated by 15% and your leptin. So ghrelin makes you hungry. It makes you, we call it the go eat hormone. It makes you like, think that it's time to eat. Your leptin is like the thermostat that says, oh, okay, we've had enough. Let's turn the machine off. So leptin decreases by 15%, ghrelin increases by 15. You've got a 30% hormone gap here of your go eat hormone when like really pushing you all day. People think um, also when they're tired, sort of like we mistake hunger for, you know, thirst for hunger. It's the same thing with sleep. We mistake food with giving us energy because we're tired. So I'm just mm. going to eat something that'll, that'll give me energy. That's an energy source. And, and was, yeah, you're right. But it's not when you're chasing the ghrelin, which has made you hungrier by, by 15% all day. 
That's insane. Yeah. And the magnitude, uh, according to the latest research I've seen, is that it can actually make you consume about 400 calories more per day, you're which exactly if, right. if you're underslept every day of the week, you know, that's almost a pound of fat gain yeah. by the end of the week. And then you and stack that week after week after week. It's, that's a spare tire. There it is. Well, yeah. and also you can't sleep and eat. Like I'm all about that, right? I can't really sleep and eat. So if I just go to bed, like I'm cutting out like an hour of eating time, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's that kind of thought process around like, I, you know, I can't exercise and eat really either, right? So those are like a couple of really good like barrier, you know, barriers to taking in fewer calories. So yeah, yeah. I couldn't agree more. Do you have any feelings on, um, on intermittent fasting as a way of sort of, you know, extending out those borders, uh, and, and that, and sort of broadening out, widening out that fasting window? Yeah. You know, I see it really, really working well, um, for people, uh, especially now in this new zoom kind of new pa pandemic ish post ish, what, you know, that because we're so sedentary, I think it helps people. I think we need to, every one of us, including myself, who I've been maintaining very easily for a long time, struggled for many months during the pandemic because this sitting all day is, I had to kind of go back to the drawing board. So what I think it, it is helpful for people to, to close that window and just give themselves a little bit of a, of a parameter, if you will, for mm. what I see of like, okay, no, it's not, I'm not eating after this. And I don't eat before this. Um, where I think people make a mistake is again, in this diet culture and them learning just the very, very top edges of a diet and just hearing about it from, from shape magazine or something like that is that they think, oh, well, if I'm going to, I'm going to eat between 12 and eight, I can eat whatever I want. Hmm. And that's this huge misconception around intermittent fasting from the diet people that I work with, which are kind of like everyday folks who are only hearing this piece of information and then thinking, well, if I do this and then they don't lose any weight because they're taking in, you know, 3000 calories in that eating window of whatever they wanted. It's very important to be feeding yourself well in that window as well. Um, but I love for people to use it to get in touch with their hunger signals as well. I find a lot of people don't know at all at this point what it actually feels like to be hungry or what it feels like to be thirsty. So I think like pushing that back and pushing that back and saying, I'm not, I'm not even hungry. Why am I eating? I'm eating because someone said I should eat breakfast and because it's eight. And kind of questioning and learning to navigate your body. I think intermittent fasting is really good for that. Kind of like finding out where and what your level of best energy is. Like for me personally, I don't eat before about one o'clock every day. And I find I have such great energy. And I had to learn that by trial and error because I was coming from a culture that said breakfast is the most important meal of the day. But through trial and error, I was like, wow, I feel great. And then by about one, if I don't start eating something, it gets, now it gets diminishing results and I get a little I get a little anxiety. I start to feel a little off. I'm not as focused. Um, but I learned if I eat too much food, right? So that's another mistake. They don't eat, they get overly hungry. And then they open that window and eat this giant meal. So it's all about kind of figuring out what works for your body through trial and error. Um, and I like that. I like being able to say, you know, get, get people to, to get in touch with what's going to really work? Are you eating when you're not hungry? You don't even know because you don't know what hunger feels like at this point. Yeah. I love that. I love the term that you use parameter. It's such a, it is, you know, like many, like, 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 like many, um, strategies that are out there, it's, it's essentially a tool. And I think one of the other, uh, potential downsides, and I'm generally a fan of intermittent fasting, but yeah, I think one of generally one of the other, one of the other, uh, downsides is that people that, um, you know, that intend on creating this fasting uh, or this feeding window for themselves. And then, you know, don't find it to be sustainable. They blow it. They eat, you know, breakfast when they uh, didn't intend to, then they have this moral failure 
this, the sense of moral failure, um, which at the end of the day, it was just a tool to begin with. And if it doesn't work for you, it doesn't work for you. It's fine. You don't need intermittent fasting to lose weight, you know, just the same way that you don't need to be on a ketogenic diet to lose weight. Oh, and that's it is, you know, I, I counsel everyone who does it is there are days I wake up and I'm, I'm hungry at 9am and I eat at 9am because I know I'm hungry. Like I know it's <laughs> true hunger. I know my body. I know what I need. So not every day looks the same. It's not this perfect, you know, like outline and you have to follow it and be perfect all the time. And if you didn't right, like you're saying that that's what I really learned is where, as we looked at that brain science was that that, that reward center, once you feel guilt and shame that you ate outside of the window, mm. now you're a bad person. I'm always like, you didn't kill anybody. You ate breakfast, you know, like, so really moving away from that, from that diet culture and diet mentality of perfectionism um, and needing to, to do it right all the time. So true. I mean, I, I generally won't eat until about noon, but if a family member texts me and it's 10 AM and they want to get breakfast, I'm not going to say no, because I've got the, I'm so rigidly trying to adhere to my intermittent fasting window or when I'm traveling, you know, sometimes not over the past two years, obviously, unfortunately, (laughs) but I love, I love traveling to Europe and whenever in your, you're in a European hotel, uh, the breakfasts are amazing. And of course, breakfast stops being served at around 10 AM. I always make use of like a good hotel breakfast. I miss those. Yeah, (laughs) me too. Um, So we don't have that much time left, but I want to talk about just one more pillar. Um, I know you said you have six, right? That you talk about in your book. Wow. Incredible. Um, But movement, let's talk a little bit about, about movement. You mentioned walking, walking is such a great uh, place to start, I guess, but what are your thoughts on, on movement and finding the, um, the discipline uh, to, to, to move more? What are, what are some simple behavior changes that people can make to, um, to, to integrate more movement into their routines? Yeah. I mean, and we are just, this is, it's breaking my heart. Like sitting is there, you know, there's the saying sitting is the new smoking there. If you sit for more than eight hours a day, you have a 90% increased risk of diabetes. That's insane. Right. So for all of this, that has happened for us, people are sitting more and those diabetes rates are going through the roof. So you really want to start thinking about kind of what I was teaching you, which is you're, you're not going, and what you said, a body in motion stays in motion, understanding that you're going to have to actually trigger and plan and habituate movement into your day. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a, Hey, okay. I drink my coffee. I put my shoes on and I walk out the door or I, you know, get up and I, you know, meet a friend or I walk my kids to school, whatever it is, and finding those ways and times to trigger that movement throughout the day. Um, There's also that very important, you know, um, just exercising for an hour and then sitting all day, it, it's as dangerous as not doing it at all almost. Mm. So it's really about standing up. So when you think about our bodies in this position that I'm in right now, right? I'm bent, I'm bent in half. I'm at this, sorry, I'm at this, this angle where blood flow is constricted to my legs. And we see that our heart rates drop and our metabolic rate drops. Um, so, you know, we have this huge metabolic drop while we're sitting. Um, So just standing up and getting blood flowing in these, you know, even 10, 15, 20 minute bursts throughout the day is, is truly life-changing. It fires up your metabolism. It changes your mood, uh, you know, so many things around it. Um, And, you know, I always say to people, like, if I can't, if I can never get you to the exercise pillar, it is by far the hardest pillar because it's so complex and difficult and it's even painful. I'll take, you know, walking, I will get you a hundred pound weight loss with just walking. That's how powerful that pillar is. So I just want people to take that away of like, again, it's not going to be, it it sounds so easy. Oh yeah, that's right. I'm just going to get these 20 minute walk breaks. I, to this day with my planned walks, still fight myself on it a lot of the time of like, "Mm, I don't have time. Oh, I should make that phone call. I'll just send that email. It's okay. And I'm like, no, you won't. And I've gotten very good at shutting that brain down, which is telling me not to do something and stay seated and say the the email will still be there, get up and go. 
I, I do love wearable technology as well because it serves as, right? Just like my water bottle serves as a trigger, having that thing on your wrist serves as a trigger and a motivator. Um, it can, it can, you can set it to buzz, you know, you can set walking challenges so that you're in competition with people. So you have more excitement around getting to that, you know, that, that, that number. So I think using technology to trigger your behavior and motivate you can be very helpful. Um, there are things like step bet, right? There's an app where you can like, you make a bet and, and win money, you know, be in a, a step bet and, and get, you know, I have lots of folks who love that because it just is like, oh, it's a small amount of money. They make like, like eight bucks, you know, like, but they get so like stuck on, like, I'm going to, I got to get to the, to the, to the step bet. Yeah. I love that. And it, it also doesn't have to cost you an arm and a leg. I don't know if most people know this, but your iPhone naturally tracks your steps. Yep. I don't know if people can see this. I'm going to hold it yep. up. My steps are miserably low for the past few days. So I'm not a don't, <laughs> you know, do as I say, not as I do kind of thing. Um, it looks like you're standing though, at least right now I'm standing. Yeah. That's I'm pretty so active. I, 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 yeah, I, um, I am I like standing. Yeah. Them. I like in the sitting, like the image I use is like a bent garden hose, right? If anyone's ever been out gardening and you get a kink in the garden hose and the water just kind of like flows really slowly, that's yeah. what's happening when you're seated. So even you just being standing right now, your blood is forced to pump it, it all the way to your top and all the way through down to your toes. And that creates a much better flow um, and much better metabolic rate. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. Um, but yeah, it's the health app in, uh, yeah, you know, there. in your iPhone. It's, it's like a little red heart. It's in a white square, a little red heart. You tap that. They've been tracking your steps, guys. It's <laughs> not your phone. It's creepy, but it's true. So you can look back at your history, you know, the, you know, the only thing I always say is like, if you're going to do it on, on that, uh, make sure that you put your phone in your pocket all the time. Cause if it's, if you, if you sit it on your desk and it's not capturing, your it's not tracking. Steps. Yeah. Yeah. Are you a big, uh, personally like gym junkie? Like, are you going to the gym I having am. crazy I'm, intense workouts or what? Yeah. I'm, a, I'm, I'm, I'm certified as a personal trainer. I oh wow, I love that. Uh, yeah, no, I, I I really believe in knowing um, everything about my six pillars and experiencing that from a true research and science and data perspective, and not just coming at you with like how I feel. Um, I I I personally. I'm addicted to exercise. I'm. I, it's totally changed my life. It 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 makes a huge difference in my mood, in my confidence, in my just the way that I perform in a day. Um, so I am a avid kickboxer. I love F45. I weight train. I run about six miles, two three times a week. Um, I just love it, and I could not. Uh, I don't think. I feel like it's such a superpower to create that habit and find how different you feel from implementing that in a day versus a day when you don't. And I think that becomes very clear um, when it becomes habitual. Yeah, you're super fit. I Six miles three times a week to me sounds like a, a nightmare. <laughs> people, people listening to that are going to be like, okay, I'm out. I cannot yeah, no, and it's not possibly replicate what this superwoman yeah. does. No, and you don't have to do that, right? Like that's, I would go back to my, like, you can walk and lose weight and you can walk and have that mood elevation. I somehow, you know, down the, down the, the years of doing this and, and loving it and, and being a part of it developed just a real, um, almost like a need for it for mental health too. Mm. I think it saved me during this pandemic. It just kept me very even and, and focused and optimistic. So yeah, no, you do not have to replicate my, my, um, levels by any means, but I would encourage people, uh, to really investigate, you know, their changes in their mood and their energy levels more than anything else. Don't use it as a weight loss tool. In fact, it can actually sometimes really confuse, uh, what looks like weight loss, because as you're gaining lean muscle, it can look like you're not losing weight on the scale and that can frustrate people. So I think like really understanding that exercise should not be about erasing food choices. It's not a giant eraser for you to go eat what you want and then go exercise it off. It's not going to work. 
um, but more around your mood, your energy, your sleep. That's another great one, right? When you think of that, that, that connection between better sleep and exercise. Um, so, so that's where I became sort of uh, addicted, if you will, to, to it. And it just feels good. I don't sleep as well on days that I, that I haven't exercised. Exercise builds Thanks. sleep pressure. Yeah. So that by the time you get, you know, by the time your head hits the pillow, your body yearns for the opportunity to rejuvenate itself and repair, um, and to, and to rebuild. Yeah. yeah. Um, I love this. Well, so, so much great information that you've dropped. Um, yeah, there, there, I, I love the, putting the focus on simple things that you can do, simple behavioral changes that are going to take the motivation factor out of it that are going to take the psychology out of it. You know, you can, I forget the quote, but it's like, uh, you, you're, you're essentially acting your way into a new way of being. Yeah, that's exactly right. And I have another thing that I say all the time. I have this like equation, right? And if you saw it on a chalkboard, right, it would be a big B over T equals R behavior over time equals results. So if you behave differently, right? If you eat a good breakfast over time, you will lose weight. If you take a 20 minute walk in the morning and then a 20 minute walk in the evening, and you do that over time, that new behavior over time equals results. So it's not find a magic food plan, stick to it, you know, hate your life, no, really examine the behaviors that over time, going to bed on time, can, and you don't have to be perfect. Consistency beats perfection every time in weight loss. So really thinking about what behaviors would I like to pick up and habituate that over time, right? If I stop eating after dinner and over time, that's going to lead to weight loss because that's 300, 500, 700 calories that we're taking in um, over time that leads to, to weight loss. I love that. Stop eating after dinner, you know, eat if you're hungry when you wake up, but check in with yourself first to, you know, to, to, and question whether or not you really truly are hungry, or if you're just eating breakfast, because somebody told you that you have to eat breakfast, that it's the most important meal of the day, drink more water, walk more, get to bed on time, create a consistent sleep schedule for yourself. I mean, you almost make it sound easy. Yeah. It, <laughs> That's, that's what I believe is that it is, it is simpler than it's been made out for you to believe hmm. and that it, it can be simple. That's the, it's the title of my book is the world's simplest weight loss program in six easy steps. It's simple, but it's not easy. So I love that. It's a brain game guys. It's get in there and know there's going to be negative self-talk and disbelief and limiting beliefs and triggers and routines and habits and, and things that, that, that that are, it's, it's simple, but not easy. So I'm not minimizing that this is a really difficult thing to do. I do it. I've been doing it personally for a lot of years. So I understand the struggle. Um, but I always say you're so worth it. You're so worth it. You do it for somebody else. And what does success look like? I mean, we know that it's seldom linear, but absolutely. But but, but what does that, I mean, what does success look like to you? You know, I think it, it's really interesting success. What I see for people is it's certainly not linear. Um, what I often see in weight loss is that people get excited and they, they, they get into the program and they have success. And then there's usually a little bit of a plateau. Hmm. And that's usually where people get kind of into the space where they're like, well, maybe it isn't working. And maybe I've come to the end of the rainbow here and I can't go any further. And what people don't understand is that like weight loss is a Rubik's cube. It changes with every season. It changes when you go back to work. It changes when the kids go back to school. It changes when you change a job. It, it's constantly changing. And so for you, when you see a little stall or when you see a small regain of weight, that that's what real weight loss looks like because mm -hmm. we have real lives with real things going on. And we have to then say, oh, you know what? Okay. I, I had to readjust all six of my pillars in the pandemic. I had to go back in and rewrite my entire journey. I had to figure out 
how to do this all over again. I didn't have a gym. I've got two kids home. I had to school them. I had to do my job. I had to figure out technology. I had I have a husband who's a Broadway actor who's now 100% out of work, right? Like this was devastating. And I just go in and it's like a Rubik's cube one by one. I said, well, how am I going to do exercise? How am I going to you know, trigger my hydration? Because I used to carry a water bottle in my bag and it was all habitual. Now it was gone. The habits are gone. So being very aware that this is like a, I call it like a board game. And sometimes life's going to come in and take all the pieces and throw them back on the floor. And you're going to think, oh my gosh, I can't do this. And I say, pick one up at a time and put it back on the board. Let's think hydration this week. Let's think food next week. Let's think movement the week after that. But don't try to do everything at once. That's a big piece. So I think success comes in, you know, for me, when I see someone understanding that this isn't linear, that this is going to go, um, it's going to take time and that it's all about your behaviors and the, and the environment and the inputs and you noticing them, noticing, right? Like me noticing, I'm starting to have more cocktails than is really going to be sustainable for a healthy life <laughs> or a healthy weight. And just being very real with myself. I'm not a bad person. I'm just creating a loop that feels good in the moment. But can I systematically unravel that? Can I start to make a kombucha cocktail? Can I start to go on a walk with my husband? Can I start to disrupt the loop that isn't giving me what I want? Ultimately, I think that's when I see real success happen. And it's not sexy, guys. Real weight loss like this that I'm talking about, it is not 10 pounds in five days. It is much more moderate and much more sustainable. You can have an ice cream cone with your family and you can live it. You know, like that's, that's what I, that's what I call success is when people realize you don't have to give everything up, but you have to make choices just like you do everywhere else in your life. I'm like, I don't understand why this spot became like this magical unicorn where, you know, all of a sudden all the rules don't apply. You don't use your work smarts. You don't use like all the things that you use everywhere in life. It all of a sudden goes out the window in this particular space. Use the skills that you have. If you're organized, if you're, you know, uh, you know, very um, highly motivated, like use what you've got and, and understand that the, the, topography of it is going to change over and over. And you're going to have to go back to the drawing board here and there to figure out, okay, I used to take sometimes 20,000 steps a day in New York city. And now I was under 3000 a day, the pandemic. So I had to figure something out. It's going to happen. It's just going to keep happening. You know, winter comes and all of a sudden I can't run outside. What am I going to do? Right? So you've got to be aware that this is not a static process at all. Like once you figure it out, you're okay. And that's the game and you're done. It's constant and it evolves. You know, I'm 50. It's not the same as when I was 30. That's a, you know, change of, of life, of, of where you are, where you live, what season it is. Just keep your eyes open as to what behaviors you need to work on now. Hey, if you like that video, you need to check out this one here and I'll see you there. You don't want to be in ketosis. You want to be making ketones, but you want to, you don't want to overproduce them. And as your body gets more and more metabolically flexible, it learns how much, how many ketones to make. Yeah. And the, you know, the cool thing is the liver can make 750 calories a day worth of ketones. Uh, and most of these ketones go to fuel the brain.